Uh, skill level newbies is absolutely fine if you are a Wireshark beginner, that's great. Not necessary to have watched our four previous episodes of Wireshark Wednesdays. That was kind of to get people's interests up and to cover some tips and tricks. Here we're taking a more structured approach into getting the cert. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Oh, hold on. There we go. Goals? Well, we're going to have a little piece where I'm going to welcome you to the course. We'll explain uh, the chapters that we're going to cover per class, explain some of the, the scheduling and what I expect out of you guys. Uh, we're going to cover chapters 1 through 3 today. Most of chapters 1 through 3, at least the, the important parts, because this is 70 minutes, we obviously can't go through each page of these chapters, but if you have the book, please go through that. Uh, we do not have a meeting next week because I will be at Narbix Boot Camp again. So you're going to have uh, two weeks before the next class, so this gives you a little chance to, to catch up. But this will be the general cadence of it. You're going to, there's 33 chapters in the book, there's 10 meetings, so you can do the math. It's a little over three chapters per meeting which shouldn't be too uh, too crazy. Uh, these first couple chapters, this first chapter, there's nothing too crazy about it. It's just an introduction, so not a big deal. Chapter two is pretty fun. It's just going through the interface of Wireshark. You know, how do you, what's this piece? What does this button do? Uh, chapter three talks about where you should start your capture, you know, the how switches behave, how routers behave. We'll, we'll talk about that. So the first three chapters, the nitty-gritty we're going to cover today. Some disclaimers. As always, this session is being recorded. You will be able to view it later. Not a problem. Uh, it will be posted on YouTube uh, probably probably not tomorrow, but it will be two days, two or three days before I post it. I've got an uh, uh, emergency trip to Phoenix, Arizona. I've got to drive out tomorrow so it'll, it'll be a while before I can uh, I can post it actually I'm driving to a data center so I could probably upload it there really quick uh, the legal stuff uh, opinions expressed here represent my own and not those of my employer some announcements uh, it's been about two weeks since we since we last had our our Wireshark 4 session any certification passes in the last two weeks Okay, anyone started studying for any new cert? Or you may have picked up a book. I know Narbix uh, CCIE version 5 book just went live, and that is inbound to me. I should get it by the end of this week. That way I can take it to class and have them sign it. Cool, Jeff got his book, so that's good. And anyone started a new job recently? Raphael's going for a CCNP DC. Data center seems to be the hot topic right now. Okay. All right, so welcoming you guys to the course, just a basic intro. This is mainly geared towards people going for their WCNA cert. Uh, but even if you're not interested in the certification, if you follow along these classes, you're going to learn a lot of Wireshark stuff along the way. I know a lot of you just want to learn about Wireshark and you're not interested in the cert. That's fine. Feel free to, to join the class. Uh, but just realize that the structure we're doing is we're following the study guide, the official study guide, and that's kind of the way we have to approach it. And by the end of this class, we are going to end it just before Thanksgiving. The 10 sessions are going to end just before Thanksgiving, and that will give you one or two weeks to, to review and cram or whatever you want to do. And then you're, we're aiming to take the actual WCNA exam in December. Right? So you know, save up your money, just aim for it in December. 
and because you want to take your test while everything is still fresh. 10 weeks covering 33 chapters, so that means approximately three plus chapters a week. And there's going to be two or three of the sessions that's going to have a couple breaks. Uh, next week is going to be one of them, and there's going to be another break uh, while I travel overseas. So just be a little careful when, when scheduling, when RSVPing on meetup.com, because I know you're getting to the habit of, okay, I'll just I'll accept this one, this one, this one, this one, but on a couple of them, they're not on consecutive weeks. Yep, Ms. Sheldon says you can catch up during those those uh, break periods. Okay, chapter one, really easy chapter. It's just an introduction into the world of network analysis. And using Wireshark, basically what Laura Chappelle wants to, to get you to understand is before you're on Linux, you're on Cisco, you're on Windows, you did a ping or you did a trace route, and you thought, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. You're seeing a lot of stuff that the normal user doesn't see. And that's true. A normal user never goes into command line, right? They never do a ping. They never do a trace route. Uh, they might never actually look at ARP tables, stuff like that. Uh, you as a network analyst, without Wireshark, you're able to go in command line, do those easy things. To you, it's easy, but to a regular user, it's like, it's like magic. Wireshark, we take it a one step further. When you run Wireshark and then you do the ping, you're going to see stuff that you never even dreamed of before. You're going to see trace route, and you're going to be able to tell where things are slowing down, where things are getting congested, where let's say you're going to have a lot of uh, repeating packets, a lot of things airing out, you could actually see that in Wireshark. Versus when you do the ping, the ping bombs out, all you're seeing is, whoa, my ping's not going through, you know, what's going on here? You have no clue really what's what's happening. And same with traceroute. Your traceroute might be bombing out at a particular node, but that's kind of it, you know, what's happening. You throw Wireshark on that link and then you could tell exactly what's going on, All right? And just to show you, I mean, let's, let's prove a point here. Let's go into your command line. All right, so pull up your command line. Whether you're on Windows, Linux, Mac, doesn't really matter. Pull up command line or, or terminal. And let's see if I can change the font on this guy. Yeah, it looks like I can. Oh my God, here we go. Okay, yes, that is my real computer name. So when you do a ping anywhere, let's ping ESPN.com. Right. Nothing too fancy, all of you need to, you know, all of you have seen how this ping works. What do you get the, from this ping? Well, you get the IP address because DNS is querying for the, the IP address. You typed in a name, DNS spits back an IP address. You ping with 32 bytes of data. You get a reply, and it gives you the time and the TTL, right? Not that exciting. You sent four, you got four. So now we go into Wireshark. You're going to keep the command prompt open. So go into Wireshark. Now, I haven't kept started capturing yet. First of all, we want to go into the interface list. Interface list is when you open, you get past the first initial screen. It's in the upper, kind of near the near upper left hand corner. Click on that guy. It's going to bring up a pop up window. These are your interfaces. Now, if you have VMware installed, you're going to have a crap load of uh, VM nets. That's fine. Most laptops today will have a Bluetooth network adapter. That's fine as well. What you're looking for is if you're on wireless, you've got the wireless network connection. And then if you're on wired, you've got the local area network connection. What you notice here is that 
one of these interfaces, you should see the packet count increasing. And in my case right here, you've got right there about 5,600 packets so far when I started Wireshark. Or not Wireshark, but when I started the program. Right. You'll see that under description, it'll probably tell you what is your chipset, what's the particular local area connection, Atheros right here. Atheros, very common chip that is used, very common adapter that's used on a lot of laptops. Uh, what's another common one? Uh, Realtek is another one. Uh, expensive laptops, Intel Pro 1000 is, is one. Uh, if you're on a desktop, uh, Intel Pro 1000, Realtek seems to be the like the, the two if you get a really really expensive motherboard you'll see the intel pro 1000s uh, but most of the other ones will have like real tech uh, you've got your mac address here you got an ip if you're running ipv6 stuff like that oh notice here if i close this out oh yeah that's our IP, that's our ipv6 right there now if we start a capture so click out of interface, Oop. we're going to have to select the interface, local area connection. If that's the one where you see the packets go up. If you're connected on wireless, connect, click on wireless. And then you click on start, right? This is the plain vanilla Wireshark. You're going to see lots of stuff flying by. You can start to see where learning how to run Wireshark, learning how to use filters, finding packets is going to be very important because things are just flying by right you're probably getting hundreds of packets a second and that's because you're connected to this uh, this podcast this video stream the majority of your packets right now are UDP and we can see that if we go to filter right here in the top top left if you want to filter out everything just with UDP just type in UDP enter lots of UTP stuff how many of you see uh, UDP coming and going to the IP address 206 81 188 178 yeah should be a trick question here because all of you should see this UDP, a lot of video is UDP. You just shoot it out. You don't care whether it's reliable. The, the frames are sent out. And this is fuse meeting, you connecting to the, to the meeting. Right? Lots of little packets. How many of you play uh, online games? League of Legends, World of Warcraft, uh, you know, any type of uh, like Counter-Strike, uh, Team Fortress, that type of stuff. If you play those games, it can be very interesting loading up Wireshark, starting it up, capturing all your interfaces. You're definitely going to see a lot of UDP, many small packets. Right? If you're at work and you're the network engineer, I highly suggest to you guys, take a laptop, plug it in uh, to a port, start up Wireshark, don't do anything, don't open up web pages, don't do anything, just let it capture stuff and see what happens because you may be surprised at what you see. I'll give you some examples. We did this the other day. Connect the laptop to just a, a random port start up Wireshark. What do I see coming down the line? I see OSPF. Is this a good or bad thing that my client machines plugged into a regular cubicle outlet should be seeing OSPF? It's a routing protocol, yeah, and my client should have no business seeing 
OSPF. Okay, so that was uh, that was an eye opener, you know. That that could make people think. Uh, we saw CDP. Now CDP, I know in a lot of books they say disable CDP because of security, but the problem with disabling CDP is you are going to render a very expensive um, <laughs> a very expensive tool obsolete. Like you, it won't work anymore. That's the fluke. Those big, those nice expensive yellow things, two thousand, three thousand dollars. You plug it into the port, and it will tell you the the port on the other side. Cisco sixty five zero nine port nine eleven gigabit Ethernet. Blah 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 blah. Right. And this you need a lot because the ports aren't labeled. No one put the sticky the sticky note or no one put the label maker on the port. It's just orange. You don't know where it goes. Right. You connect in, you get a light, but What's the other side? All right. So if you disable CDP, you're going to miss a lot. So let's check this out. On my network here, we're going to type in CDP. And you can see that I am getting CDP on this port. Now, hopefully, you guys at, at home, if you're not connected to a Cisco router, you should not be getting CDP. If I know some of you are still at work. If you are connected to a Cisco router, then you are getting, you are getting CDP. All right. Yeah, Sheldon says, oh, LLDP. Yep. Not on my network, nothing. Here's something to look for. Type in IPv6. Okay. Now, depending on your operating system, you might see some, a little, or maybe a heck of a lot of IPv6. Now, on my particular computer, I don't have too much IPv6 coming down the line because I disable a lot of that stuff. But on yours, you may see a lot. If you have more than, let's say, 10 IPv6 packets, you may want to check your network connections. And if you're on Windows, I'm pretty sure Windows by default now you get a whole bunch of IPv6 stuff automatically enabled for you. And that's exactly what you're seeing. Okay. So if you're not seeing IPv6, good. Okay, so we're just playing around here, just having fun. But let's go back to what we originally wanted to do, we wanted to see what happens when you do a ping. So for filter, we're going to do ICMP. And hit enter, and it'll probably come up blank. And that's fine. We're going to go back to our command line window. We're going to type in ping ESPN.com again. So before we just got some boring stuff. Now we have Wireshark open. We do the ping again. Let it go for a little bit. And let's see what we got. Okay, so you have source and destination. You can see that your source is whatever your IP address is going to a destination, 199-181-132-250. Now, does anyone else have a different IP address other than 250? The one for ESPN. All right. So if you're getting 199-181-132-250, 250, that's ESPN. And as we click on each packet, 
you're going to get the details of that packet down here in this pane in the bottom half of the screen. And I've turned off my summary pane. I think I'll, I'll leave that turned off. That's fine. Yeah, I'll turn it back on. Okay, so you have three panes. You got the top pane, which is your list. Your middle pane, which has more information. And the bottom gives you the raw output. As we click through the listing, you'll see that the contents of the second and third panes according, adjust accordingly. So it depends on what you're clicking on. Now you may already notice something pretty awesome with, a, with the contents of a ping. Look at the details down here. Just any of the pings. Just click through and you'll notice a pattern. And the data portion of the ping, look at that. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, right? Continues on and then it says hi. All right, how many of you are able to see the A, B, C, D in the details of this? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? I mean, you, you you thought, you know, what the heck is in the data part of the ping? Well, this, this is what's in the data part. Now, is anyone running this in Linux? Darn it. I was going to say, if you're, if you're running in Linux, run the Wireshark, do the ping, and tell me if the packet format is the, is the same. Okay. All right. So that's the bottom. This is the raw output down here. If we go to this middle pane, you can, you can expand it by doing that. You know, move it around. You can get rid of these panes by going up to View. It's in the top toolbar right here the third one over, and you've got packet list, packet details, packet bytes. So we can get rid of packet bytes to clean it up a little bit. And you could always get it back. Okay, so Mac OS shows uh, numbers one through nine. Yep. So what you're seeing is Certain network tools like ping, traceroute, that type of stuff, they look different depending on what operating system you do it from. So if you send a ping from Windows, it's going to look a certain way. If you send a ping from Mac OS X, it's going to look a different way. And I'm going to assume that if you send a ping from Linux, it's going to look uh, in a different way as well, right? So things like Nessus or intrusion detection devices, scanners, network vulnerability scanners, stuff like that, you're sending commands, you're sending pings to something and it responds back a certain way. You're fingerprinting the operating system depending on what the response is. Okay, so if something comes back A, B, C, D, so and so, you can pretty much be assured that that's a Windows machine, right? Or it's a Linux machine. Okay, so Raphael says, Debian says 0 through 7. Uh, does it end at 7 or does it keep going? Ends at 7. Okay, so if you see, if you look in the, if you ran Wireshark, so let's think about this. We run Wireshark on a link. Let's assume that we're actually capturing all the traffic. And you see ICMP. And you're at a window shop, right? They tell you that there should be no Linux machines anywhere on the network. And you start clicking through these things and you see, oh, wait, there's a one through seven, right? Yeah, 
the Mac OS X should also end in 7. And the reason for that is OS X is actually based on what? Yep, so it's all it's all Linux variant. Okay, so all this stuff you couldn't see in command line, right? So compare all this information that you have here to the stupid Windows command line. This was all you got in Windows command line. Not too much versus all this awesome stuff. Also in Windows, the, the time was down to milliseconds in, uh, in Wireshark. If you have it turn, tuned out, you could be a lot more precise, several orders of magnitude more precise. Right? So just a little taste of, of what you can see, just to get you kind of going, okay, well, you know, it's, it's pretty cool what I can see with, with Wireshark. And it can be pretty scary as well, right? Okay, you can you can keep Wireshark capturing. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna bother too much, bother your computer too much. Okay, so chapter one is just basically telling, okay, how does Investigator look at things? Uh, you know, use Wireshark. It's gonna open up the window. It's gonna basically uh, take off the curtains uh, out of a lot of stuff that you normally don't see. Uh, what is Wireshark used for? It's used for things, you know, the basic thing that a lot of you guys are going to run into is network optimization. You know, people complaining that the network is slow. Well, you have to, you have to you know, troubleshoot it and optimize it. Troubleshooting and optimization. Troubleshooting would be, I can't get to a particular server. I can't reach the internet. I can reach the server, but I can't pull a file. Or I can connect successfully to FTP, but the FTP bombs out. You know, stuff like that. VPN is dying. All of these questions can be answered using Wireshark. Forensic analysis. You want to prove that a certain person surf to a website, downloaded a file. You want to prove that a particular computer was on your network. You want to prove, uh, you, you, know, you want to prove that at this time he could not have downloaded the file. It wasn't him because there was no transfer. That file didn't go across at that time, right? Sometimes proving that something did not happen is, is just as valuable or even more valuable than proving that it did happen. Uh, you're seeing sometimes a lot where uh, child porn cases aren't exactly cut and dry, right? So people think, oh, well, we, we, we found that there are files on his computer. Boom, slam dunk, conviction, done, throw him in jail, right? But you're seeing there have been several cases where it's been put on the guy's computer. Guy had nothing to do with it. Guy wasn't even home. He wasn't logged in, you know, stuff like that. So Wireshark can help with the forensic analysis. Any questions so far? We're just beginning to scratch the surface, just having fun with Wireshark. You know, just just wanted to show you that the possibilities just from ping itself. Ping, you thought before, was really simple. You get not too much information from it. But when you look at ping while running Wireshark, it opens up a whole new world of troubleshooting. Yeah, definitely ICMP, the, the codes and all that stuff. You're probably going to get hit with a lot of that in uh, CCNP, CCIE. Okay, speaking of forensic analysis, 
that leads us into chapter two, introduction to Wireshark. Pretty fun chapters, just basically Laura's taking you through the interface, clicking on this, clicking on that, just basically knowing where things are. And a lot of your questions on the test, I do have the exam prep book, which is kind of the second, it's a companion book to the official study guide, and it has practice questions. And a lot of the practice questions are pretty simple, as in, you want to do this, where do you click? Or you want to find this folder, how do you find the location of that folder? Right? Very simple if you actually go through Wireshark and, and do it. Now the forensic analysis, a lot of times you're going to be needing to take screenshots. right? And the screenshots will be for, uh, you need to prove something. You'll have like uh, packets up here and there's going to be a screenshot and they're going to blow it up onto a poster board to show the jury. So you have a stick pointer or a laser pointer. It's like, at this time, this ping went across and did this and this and this. Well, you don't want to have a generic title for while you're doing these, uh, these legal things. You want to set the title bar to be like your name, the date, uh, the case number, or, you know, whatever. The lawyer is going to have his specific uh, meaning because they need to well, they need to charge for all this. Uh, plus, they also need to keep all this in order because you could have a case, you could be standing up for three hours and have like 50 charts up there, 50 poster boards up there. You need to keep these things in line, right? So changing the title bar up here is very important. And they are going to ask you, well, how do you change the title bar of this? Pretty simple, but if you've never done it before, it can be, it can be difficult. So we're going to do that. We're going to go into Preferences. It's Edit and Preferences. Click on there. All right, we have a lot of stuff here, but what we want to get to is we want to click on User Interface, Expand Out User Interface, and then go to Layout. It's right below that. Now you can see up here, this one, two, three, those are your panes. You have three panes. They're ordered by default like that. You can change the order however you want. You can change it into all types of different uh, configurations. This last one right here where it's uh, top down vertical, this is pretty awesome if you have a larger monitor. So if you have a 24 inch or the, the LG from Costco, you know, this can, this can work out if you have a normal like 17 inch monitor 20 inch monitor that the defaults fine it's it's okay but changing the title bar is down here custom window title so you can change that however you want let's see Bert is evil September 3rd 2014 Right, and you'll see right here, Bert is evil up there. And you can see it tells you the Wireshark version. Right. Seemingly very simple, but very important thing to remember in a legal case. Anytime you're doing screenshots for legal cases here. Right, changing the title bar, edit preferences and layout. Let's go back to edit preferences and layout. Filter bar, all these things, icons, you know, stuff like that. Let's cancel out. There's another thing they're going to ask you is where is Wireshark putting all the configuration, the profiles? Because the way that things are laid out here, how you set your panes, the fonts, all that stuff. You know, if, if we want to change the font, we could definitely do that. We can zoom in or zoom out. And it's going to remember all of this. So where is that information stored? Because sometimes you're going to need to have everything look the same on all of your computers. 
laptop, desktop, laptop 2, desktop 2, that type of stuff. You're going to need to transport things around. So you're going to need to find where all your folders are stored, the configuration files within those folders. And a lot of people will think they're going to trick you on the test. They're going to try to say, oh, it, it's an edit preferences. Right. This is, I mean, logically, in most places, you're going to go into edit preferences on most programs. It's actually going to be under help and about Wireshark. So help is the last guy right here, help about Wireshark. And then you're going to have the third tab over is called folders. It's kind of tricky. So it's actually under about Wireshark. So here, basically, links to where the actual program is. Most important part is probably the global configuration and personal configuration. So your preferences and the plugins folder, just in case you get some more plugins or you decide to write one yourself. All right, so we can actually click, double click on the global preferences. It takes us to our program files, Wireshark. And you can see we've got a profiles folder there as well. You can double click on that. And how many of you have the classic folder under profiles? You can double click on that. Yep, so in Debian, user, share, Wireshark, that, yeah, that makes sense. Right, so knowing where your profiles and configuration stuff is stored, very, very important. And we could close out of there. All right. So if you ever have any, anyone ask you, how do I get my Wireshark to look like your Wireshark? Well, you go to help. About Wireshark, folders, and copy the personal and global configuration copy that over, transfer it to the other laptop or other computer or the other guy, and that should get it to look exactly the same. Okay, any questions about changing the title bar or knowing where to find those folders? Okay. Oh, while we have packets coming in, we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit. We are going to get back to interface options, but let's get into marking and ignoring packets. Control M is to mark, Control X is to ignore. Let's see what that, that exactly does. So if we take out this filter, hit enter. Oh my God, probably shouldn't have done that, but uh, yeah, you got lots of stuff. Let's let's stop this capture. <laughs> Dear God. Okay, so whoa. I just saw something that caught my eye. Yes, you can change those folders. Okay, so I'm connected on a regular cubicle port. I see STP. So that gives me an idea. If I click into filter, STP, hit enter. Yikes. Look at that. And so I'm probably getting one every two seconds. That kind of makes sense. You look at the time. Yep, that's every two seconds. That looks about right. Yeah, so I probably shouldn't be getting uh, STP down to the down to the client side, but you know. So this looks interesting. Okay, 
we'll kill that filter. So let's say we're looking through our our list here of of packets, and we we get to that spanning tree one or whatever you find, and you want to mark it for for later perusal. You want to get back to this somehow. Hit Control M, right? Control M, and go a couple more. Control M. Go a couple more. Let's see if we can get this to work. Control M and Control M. Let's see if we can get that to work. And then we have these controls up here. All right? We got controls. We can go back in the packet history. All right? This back arrow goes us, gets us back by one. Right, I keep going, keep going, right? And as you can see, what's happening here is I'm kind of flipping all around. So I have certain things marked. I could go next. And you can see I'm clicking next. And it's going between all the ones that I have marked. It's cycling through everything. If you want to go to a packet with a number, you can click on this. It's like an arrow and a circle. So if you want to go to packet 1000, you could do that. It's packet 1000. And first and last packets, it's simply the up arrow with a line across it and up arrow with a line at the bottom. So pretty fun stuff. You can also mark and uh, unmark through the menu over here. So you can see we've got uh, mark, unmark packet, control M, shift, control M, mark all displayed packets. Right, that's how it looks if you shift, control M. So why would you mark all displayed packets, or, or you know, why, why even mark stuff? Well, if you right-click now on any packet, you can copy these out. And so what happens if you copy these out? Well, let's see. If we copy out summary and text, let's see what we get with that. And probably not a good idea that we had every packet marked, but we'll wait a little bit. Okay, now let's see. Let's open up a text editor and paste. Okay, it looks like it just gave me that packet I had selected, so that's pretty good. I was expecting a flood of stuff. Okay, so there's a question, is there a fast way clear mark packets. So if you only have 10 mark packets, if, is, it, is there a way to unmark all in one keystroke? Well, we were able to mark everything with shift control M. Let's see here. Shift control D. Oh no, my Camtasia is intercepting my shift control D. And also on my, uh, on my zoom it, it's intercepting my control. Yeah, there's a difference between control. I'll have to look into that. And I'll have to fix my, uh, my key interception on that.
Okay, so you can see here, it's actually, to go to the next mark packet, shift control n shift control n here we have control alt m let's give that a shot control alt m clears everything out All right so if you go here control m to mark it shift control m to mark everything control alt m to delete those markings Yes, if you had a filter in place, it would mark just the stuff that's been displayed on the screen. So if you do this, if you filter out everything for DNS, right, so that's all my DNS. Control Shift M marks everything that's on my screen that's for DNS. So it can be very useful in, in doing a lot of stuff. Uh, DNS is one of the first things I'll immediately look at. I'll just filter everything out by DNS just to see what web pages have been called up. Okay, let's clear out that filter. So just to recap on the copying stuff, if you click on any packet, you right click on it, you'll see that you've got the copy option. You could shoot it into text or CSV. I click on text, nothing too special happens. What you have to do is go into, it's in your clipboard, and then you can paste stuff in there. All right, so that's my packet there. If I right click on any others, copy, text, paste that guy in there. Okay. Another thing is looking at the statistics. Also something very cool. You get a nice easy graph of everything that's happening. Statistics, IO graph. I know a lot of people start at summary. I go to IO graph because it gives me a nice uh, throughput. Let's expand this out. Okay, so that's my IO graph. And if I scroll through, you can see that at zero seconds, it's giving me kind of how busy my network is. We got number of packets on the right hand side. You see I have a little spike up here, a little spike up here. Spikes over there. You can change the axis over here. So if you want to change it from packets into bytes, you could click the drop down and go to bytes. Sometimes you want to look at packets, other times you want to look at bytes. Why would you want to look at bytes? Well, if you're trying to track down someone who's been downloading a lot, change that to bytes, kind of look through the graph, and okay, we have a spike right there. What, what could that be? Telltale signs of BitTorrent. Well, I'll show you the telltale signs of BitTorrent. If you see something like that, that guy right there is indicative of someone setting a download upload limit. So you know in BitTorrent you can set the download limit, you know, you're trying to be sneaky or whatever. Uh, I'll just download at 10 megs. You get a lot of seeders. You're downloading, um, I don't know, a Linux ISO or something like that. It maxes out and it's going to stay there until everything finishes.
All right, so pretty pretty cool tool to immediately get and see how busy your network is. Okay, we'll close out of there. And of course, you could copy it or whatever, but we'll just close it out. And then go back to statistics Another place I go to is conversations, statistics, conversations. So IOGRAPH is first, then I go to conversations. I want to see who's talking to who. So first tab is our Ethernet. Right, here you're seeing MAC addresses. You could sort these however you want. If you want to sort by packets or bytes, you know, who's the who's the most talkative, that's fine. So MAC addresses, we have IP addresses right here. IPv6, awesome. Some UDP stuff. TCP conversations. It's all all pretty cool, right? And this is not uncommon to get uh, you know this many in this amount of time because web pages like ESPN, like CNN, or whatever, you think you're going to a single web page, but you're actually pulling up a couple dozen. Okay, we'll close out of there. Going back to statistics, packet lengths is something very interesting. Just create stat there. You don't need to create a filter or anything. So packet links, what the heck is this all about? If you're trying to troubleshoot uh, retransmissions, bad cables, uh, stuff like that, Knowing what all the packet links are, or the distribution of the packet links, is pretty interesting. Uh, this can be especially useful if you have a network uh, network attached storage, NAS device like a Synology box. Synology box is basically a box you can put in four hard drives, five hard drives, whatever, and it raids it out, and you plug in a gigabit Ethernet, and you have uh, basically your own little, you know, server farm of, of hard drives, you know, storage farm. For that to work effectively, you really need to be transferring jumbo frames, frames larger than 1,500 bytes. And if you if you if it's slow, you fire up Wireshark, capture for a little bit, and you see that you don't have any packets over 1,500 bytes, that could be a problem. That probably means that in the Synology box, you don't have jumbo frames enabled, or your switch doesn't support jumbo frames, stuff like that. All right, so this is where you can see instantly what's going on here. If you're one of those crazy guys that do VoIP, you know, voice over IP, the majority of your packet should be on kind of the lower end right here. Right, because generally the codecs and the, the packets are small for VoIP. If you do not have a network attached storage and you see lots of stuff that are 2,000, 2,500 bytes or more, it could mean that you're under attack. Right? There should be, if you no one's running network attached storage. You're not running the brocade stuff. You don't have a NetApp. You know, you're just regular computers and you're seeing big humongous packets. That could be something else. Right. So this graph right here doesn't distinguish between incoming or outgoing packets. This is just both. It's all the, all the packets I saw. So depending on where you put your Wireshark will determine what information you get. We'll actually talk about where do you put your Wireshark 
to, to get the best capture. Okay, we'll cancel out of that. Go back to statistics. Protocol hierarchy, I sometimes go to this, but not, not too much. So you can click on statistics and protocol hierarchy. It sounds exactly what it does. It gives you a distribution of the different types of protocols that are running over your network. Got some TCP, we got some SSL. Ethernet should be 100%. A lot of this has been uh, UDP. Yeah, UDP is like 65% of everything that's going on in terms of packets, and that's because we're doing video. So some of these you can do as a report. Others, as you can see from this uh, statistics right here, um, you know, you're just going to have to screenshot it. And also, uh, amazingly enough, Riverbed sells other tools that make reports. Uh, there are companies that will, will make reports from packet captures much easier than Wireshark itself. And if you can imagine they cost some money here. But let's, yeah, let's search for that. Why not? So I just search for creating Wireshark reports for legal. Is there some Steel Central? Yeah, Steel Central should do it. So for those you don't know, Wireshark is the, the public, completely free packet capture. Riverbed supports Wireshark. Uh, Steel Central, there's a personal edition, there's a, a Uber edition that can capture multiple points at the same time. Um, Steel Central is the next step up. So if you want to do some more complicated things, mainly it is reporting. And uh, how much do they charge for this? It's a 10 day trial. Well, let's, oh my God. That's the cascade box to store everything. Oh, we'll have to find that out. See if we can get a, see if we can get a discount. Yeah, I saw the ninety thousand dollar thing, but that's for that's for something else. That's not for the actual uh, <laughs> Steel Central software. Okay, so we went over statistics. We looked a little bit about preferences, folders. Folders are very important. You have to know exactly where to find them, and it's under help. Uh, we glossed over inter interface options, so let's go back to that. So before we started capturing all this mess, we went to capture and interfaces that brings you back to the same menu that, that you saw before. If you click on options here, so the way we went there was capture, interfaces, and options. You can see that in the top portion here, these are our interfaces. Use promiscuous mode on all interfaces that that makes that should be checked. Uh, I don't know why you would uncheck uh, use promiscuous mode on any of this when you're using Wireshark. What promiscuous mode is is your interface, your network interface has a MAC address, right? So if it's made by Cisco, it begins with a certain MAC address. The last half of the MAC address is uh, a serial number, and you're only going to, if you're not in promiscuous mode, you're only going to look at packets that have, that are addressed to your MAC address. So like if you're in an apartment, you open up your mailbox and you live in apartment one, 
and you see all the all the mail for some reason all the mail goes to a single mailbox and so you just pick up the stuff addressed to apartment one you're a good neighbor that's good okay. using promiscuous mode is like being the bastard neighbor you read everyone's email you read everyone's mail you go to the mailbox you live in apartment one the mail is addressed to apartment two you don't care you open it and uh, I think you probably committed a felony by opening up someone other, someone else's mail, but you don't care. You open everyone's everyone's mail. That's what promiscuous mode does: is you're opening up all the frames for all the MAC addresses. So should have that checked. It's checked by default. If you want to save to multiple files, that's fine. You could chop it up every however many megabytes or whatever. Usually it's fine just saving it to a single file. Packet PCAP NG is the next generation format. If you want to use the old PCAP format, you can uncheck that box. I showed you in the Wireshark Wednesday series that the one reason that you may want to uncheck this box is if you're going to dump this into Network Forensic, Network Miner, any of those tools, and tools that only only take in a regular PCAP file. And then you could have a time capture, a stop capturing after a certain amount of time. Why would you want to use this? I'll give you a good reason why is if you want to go and say you want to have uh, statistics across a set of computers in the same network you want to see if the problem is is the same on all the computers so you go on 10 computers you do wireshark and you say all of them capture up to 10,000 packets and you have the the packet capture and then when you run the statistics the distribution of protocol should be relatively the same across all of them that's one reason why you would do this. Over here in the bottom right hand side of your display options, uh, these are mainly checked and unchecked if you're capturing on a very fast link and you have a slow computer. Update packets in real time. If your computer is a little bit slow and you're capturing on a gig link, uncheck that guy. And because you don't want all this crap flying up on the screen and your computer melting down. And resolve names. If you want to be quiet about your capture, you want to be forensically sound, you don't want to reintroduce crap on the network, uncheck these boxes because what's going to happen is as you get a MAC address, as you get an IP address or a DNS name or whatever, it's going to try to resolve that. And that means your computer is going to throw extra traffic onto the wire. Okay, cool. Got about six minutes left. All right, so some, some options, some capture options to think about when you're capturing on a very busy link. Oh, here's a good one that for you guys. Firewall ACL rules. So a lot of you guys are studying for Cisco, Cisco ASA, Cisco IOS, and you're like, okay, so in Wireshark, I see a packet that I don't like. Like maybe, maybe I don't want to have this OSPF hitting my clients. Maybe I should make a filter that blocks this. Right, so I, I click on any one of these, yeah, it just doesn't matter. Now, if you don't have any OSPF packs, don't worry about it, just click on any, any packet you have in Wireshark. Okay. Anyone, doesn't matter. Then you go up to Tools, and then Firewall ACL Rules. So what this does, I'll expand this up a bit. is this lets you build rules, pretty pretty simple rules, uh, that you can paste into 
your Cisco or Linux devices. I think you could also do Windows, I believe. And uh, you know that way it takes a lot of the guesswork out of out of doing all this stuff. Okay, so you may you may see in the drop down list there's Cisco standard extended uh, IP tables for you Linux guys. Oh, net net SH. So you could do it into Windows firewall. Okay, so let's do Cisco iOS extended. So you can see right here access list number. It's telling you know whatever you want. Deny IP host 172.18.76.1 any. Uh, you click the drop down right here. You can filter by IP. Here I'm given the option to filter by 224.005, and you can do the direction. Now, if I cancel out of there, if I take a look at uh, some DNS stuff, let's go to a different packet. And let's see, I'm going to click on uh, that guy right there. Then go back up to Tools and Firewall Rules. Oh, it doesn't like that one. If I go to Extended, this is Access List, Deny UDP, Any, Any equals 5353. That's the port number for this guy. Let's see how it looks in IP tables. Just click the drop down and net filter IP tables. IP tables dash A, blah, 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 blah. We got our MAC address right there and drop. I can click copy, paste it, whatever. I could save it. I could do lots of stuff. They're not going to get too crazy on the firewall ACL rules. They just want you to know where to find it and what would be the appropriate drop-down box to, to use. Right, but this is a pretty pretty cool utility. Now, if you guys are going for CCIE, you won't need... Uh, you know, a good CCNP, good CCIE, you probably will never need to, to go here because it's like, okay, dude, I, I know how to do my I know how to do my access list by memory. But you know, just in case you forget, there it is. Okay, packet notes. This is the last thing we'll do. Packet notes. You're going through all your packets. There's a lot of them. And you want you want to have some notes. Well, we have a comment feature. If you right-click and go to Packet Comment, you can add some comments. You know, whatever. I wonder if it understands hyper hypertext. Probably not, but let's see. Okay. Now, as you notice, if you keep your cursor clicked on that packet, it adds another line in your details here. Now you see packet comments. If I expand that out, I get all this crap. Right? If I click the next packet down, I don't have that thing saying packet comments. Hit the up arrow, get back there if there's my comments. So why would you use packet comments? Packet comments would be, you're like the low level investigator. So you're the Wireshark number one. And there's like another guy that had 10 years experience. He's like this Uber guy. So what you would do is you would packet comment. Hey, Bob, take a look at this. I think it's, you know, the start of blah, 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 you know. Illegal transfer, BitTorrent, whatever. All right, so that guy would go through. Okay, there's a comment on this guy. Let's start taking a look. Okay. So pretty easy stuff. Uh, everyone remember to read chapters one through three in that book. I know it, it is kind of expensive. It is. It looks pretty decent on um, on Kindle. I've got the one on iPad. The iPad version is very nice. 
Okay, so there's a question. Can you filter on comments? Is there a way to search for comments? That's a good question. So we could definitely filter by comments, searching within them. I'll have to look that up. Heck, I'll make a video out of it when I find out. But at least we can search for it. Packet CCC, what's that? Oh, by the way, this filter bar right here, you notice that I was typing in stuff like TCP, UDP, all that good stuff. You will learn a lot, and we truly are going to end after this. If you didn't know the options to search for, there's a ton of crap that you could search for. So let's say if you were looking for TCP dot, and you can look for the ACK, you could look for just all types of stuff, and it will fill in stuff for you. Flags. You, you could go completely crazy on the filter box. Right. So that was our, our first meeting of Wireshark. Wireshark WCNA session number one. We're going to have nine more. Uh, this has been recorded. It will be posted up within a couple of days so you guys can review it. And, uh, you know, should be a good should be a good session. Uh, I can hang out with you for a couple minutes, not too long, because I've got to drive off to Phoenix. But let me stop the recording, and then all of you can open up your mics, and we'll chat. Recording of the conference has stopped.